A man named Manny was sitting at his desk one morning working diligently when his boss came up and asked him a very strange question. Manny, he said, do you believe in the resurrection? Manny was startled and he thought to himself, what kind of question is that? This is not a topic for the workplace. But even though he was surprised by the boss's question, Manny replied, yes, sir, I believe in the resurrection. I am a Christian. Well, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Manny, his boss said, because I have a confession to make. I didn't believe in the resurrection until yesterday afternoon. Really, Manny said, what, what changed your mind? Well, you see, after you left early to go home to your grandmother's funeral, she stopped by the office to see you. And it was at that moment that I became a true believer in the resurrection. What would it be like if the resurrection showed up where you work, or at your school, your house, your business, your board meeting? What if the resurrection showed up at the office, the bank, the store, the university, or for that matter, the church? I know it seems preposterous, but that's exactly what happened in John 21. Peter and the disciples were fishermen. That was their original occupation. The sea was their workplace, and they were very hard at work when the risen Jesus showed up out of nowhere on the shoreline and started calling out to them just like he had at the beginning of the gospel. The entire story of the disciples' lives had now come full circle, from fishing to fishing, from calling to calling, from sea to shining sea. But the disciples' deja vu, groundhog day moment of returning to the fishing boats and looping back to the sea is completely ridiculous. It makes no sense. What in the world are Peter and the disciples doing back fishing as if nothing has happened? You might remember, resurrection happened, empty tomb happened, Crucifixion happened, torture happened, trial happened, denial happened, arrest happened, betrayal happened, last supper happened, turning over the tables happened, life and ministry happened. So what in the world are Peter and the disciples doing back out on the water in a fishing boat? They've gone back to the beginning. Back to square one as if Jesus never happened, cross never happened, grave never happened, resurrection never happened, and it was all for nothing. They'd just seen the risen Jesus. One chapter before this, Christ appeared to them saying, peace be with you, and breathed the Holy Spirit on them. Then there's that whole business with Thomas needing to put his fingers in Jesus' side. They'd remember that, right? So what are they doing right back where they started? Why the heck are they fishing? If the resurrection is so important, how did they forget about it so quickly? Well, don't we all do that every year? Easter is not a single Sunday, but a 50-day season. Yet how many of us are living like it's still Easter, like resurrection happened? This is the frustrating reality of discipleship. The disciples are so forgetful, so clueless, so obtuse. And Peter is the quintessential follower of Jesus, who misses the point all the time. He's impetuous and impulsive and over the top. His life as a follower of Jesus is a master class in extremes, oscillating back and forth like a pendulum from belief to doubt, praise to rebuke, courage to cowardice, fidelity to failure, and all the way back again. He walked out on the water only to sink after his first step. He always needed Jesus to explain the parables to him. In one breath, he proclaimed Jesus is the Messiah and was renamed the rock on which the church is built. And in the next breath, he was rebuking Jesus for talking about death, to which Jesus responded, Get behind me, Satan. He saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain, But then he tried to stay there a little too long. He refused to let Jesus wash his feet, but when he realized what Jesus was doing, he said, wash my hands and my head too, which Jesus refused. He insisted he would lay down his life and never deny Jesus, and yet then he denied him three times around the charcoal fire before the cock crowed. He cut off the ear of the temple police officer in the garden, but Jesus healed the man and said, those who live by the sword die by the sword. 
Peter's return to fishing is the cherry on top of an impetuous life of extremes. Somehow, even after he saw his teacher risen from the dead and standing before him, Peter still went back to fishing. And worse, he convinced the other disciples to follow. Peter's behavior seems so ridiculous that none of us would ever imagine that we would ever be as feckless or as extreme as Peter. And yet we are all like Peter, aren't we? Today is the first time we've gathered for worship in person since September of 2020, eight months ago. To use a word from Adam Grant's article this week in the New York Times, we've been languishing. Uh, languishing under the stress of the COVID-19 pandemic, feeling that deep sense of stagnation and emptiness as we've muddled through our days, looking at life through a foggy windshield in the void between depression and human flourishing. Adam Grant claims that the, the danger of languishing is that we didn't notice the dulling of our motivation or the disruption of our focus or the dwindling of our drive. We don't catch ourselves while we're languishing, slipping slowly into solitude. We're indifferent to our indifference, and when we can't see our own suffering, we don't know how to ask for help or how to help ourselves. If you combine our languishing with all the grief we experienced during COVID as a result of the loss of jobs and businesses, birthdays and holidays, time and money and friends and loved ones, we want nothing more than for everything to just go back to the way it was, back to normal. And the compounding trauma of the social and political moment we find ourselves in America today filled with attacks on transgender people, mass shootings, and police killings of black children, it is enough for any person in our world to be completely overwhelmed. The desire to go back to the way the world was before the pandemic is natural and very real. We want to go back. When the going gets rough, we want to go back to what we know. We want to go back to the way it was before the crisis. Back to the way it was before the pain and the heartache and the death and the loss. Back before the languishing and the grief. We want to go back to what is familiar. Back to what felt good. Back to the way things were back in the glory days. Or back to when we felt best about ourselves or our lives or the world around us. We want to pretend like this once-in-a-century global health crisis never happened. Yet our desire to go back to the normal is just like the disciples, like their desire to return to the sea as if the crucifixion and resurrection never happened, to go back to fishing as if their betrayal and denial of Jesus never happened. Jesus had called them away from the family business, you might remember, that family business they were in that was embedded in an extractive economy that was making the fish paste for King Herod and the Romans. He called them to stop fishing for the empire and start fishing for people, fishing for the sake of humanity. Hooking people was a term employed by the prophets Amos and Ezekiel as a euphemism for snatching the rich and the poor out of the jaws of evil and delivering people from the water of oppression. Jesus called ordinary people, common laborers, Galilean peasant fishermen to join him in the work of raising people like fish out of the water of empire and into a new humanity, a new creation, and a new kingdom. But the disciples had gone back to business as usual. Not only that, they had defected from their calling, abdicated their responsibility, and resigned their commission to fish for humanity. They'd gone back to the ordinary task of catching ordinary fish when they should have been engaged in the extraordinary task of catching people. There's a word for acting like nothing happened and trying to go back to normal. It's called denial. Denial. A pathology. A kind of giving up of its own. A form of hopelessness and despair. It's not just denial of the pandemic or denial of change. It's the denial of reality. The truth is there is nowhere to go back to. 
things have changed permanently. And they might not be better or worse, but they'll never be what they were. Just like us, isn't it? None of us are the same people we were back in March of 2020, are we? As if a long pandemic didn't change us, many of us literally had our DNA altered by a vaccine. We are different people now, biologically, spiritually, emotionally, physically. We are different people. And our church is different too. We are not the same church we were back in March of 2020. It would be a shame if we were. There's no point in trying to recover the past because there's no past to recover. It doesn't exist. There is only now, this present moment, and the future out before us. The problem we face now 14 months into this pandemic is as old as time. It's the problem of nostalgia. One writer defines nostalgia as the lazy exercise of comparing the best of the past to the worst of the present. Comparing the best of the past to the worst of the present, which is an activity that never leads to anything but dissatisfaction, disappointment, negativity, and discontent. I love the way Oscar-winning actress Simone Sigourney titled her 1978 memoir. It's called Nostalgia. It ain't what it used to be. There's another woman named Simone who talked a lot about nostalgia. French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, who claimed that nostalgia is a form of nihilism, which is the rejection of all religious and moral principles and the belief that life is meaningless. We don't often think about nostalgia as nihilism, but in her book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, she wrote that nostalgia is the desire to return to how free we felt as children before we discovered as adults that freedom requires responsibility. Governments and corporations benefit from promoting nihilism in the form of nostalgia as a way to distract us from reality. This is why we must not only recognize the nihilism and nostalgia in ourselves, but also confront the way that is being used in the world around us. Rather than letting ourselves feel powerless in a world that seems to have stopped caring for human beings, we must ask where the nostalgic views of the world are coming from and who benefits from seeing the world that way. There's no good news in nostalgia, but there is great news in this story. Even though they were languishing in grief and loss with denial, betrayal, abdication, resignation, nihilism, and nostalgia, back at work fishing like nothing happened, that is exactly where the resurrection shows up. That is exactly where Jesus shows up even though they'd return to life as normal, basically rejecting the cross and resurrection, acting as if the life and ministry of Jesus had never even occurred, Jesus still shows up for them and shows up with love. He shows up at their workplace and calls them as beloved children of God. He used the Greek word for children here, the word that means offspring, those who belong to him, and he offered to help them with what they're doing out on the sea. And when Peter figured out that it was the risen Christ, he went overboard again, as he always did. And so then Jesus invited them for breakfast on the beach. He used their languishing, their grief, their loss, their confusion, their denial and resignation, their nostalgia, their return to fishing. He used all that to call them again from the shoreline and invite them to follow him once more. Resurrection is an open invitation. That is the definition of hope. No matter how far we fall or how many times we turn away from Jesus or our neighbors, no how many times we go back to fishing, there is always another chance. Our God is the God of second chances, the God of third time's a charm, the God of four left turns is a new beginning, the God of five-point plans, the God of infinite opportunities. That is the epitome of grace. 
The call to follow Jesus, to love our neighbors, to live in solidarity with all of humanity, to care for the earth and all of its creatures, is always being extended to us over and over and over again. As scholar Albert Schweitzer famously wrote, Jesus comes to us as one unknown, without a name as of old, by the lakeside, as he came to those who knew him not and speaks to us the same words, follow me, and sets us to the task which he has for us to fulfill in our time. He commands, and to those who obey, whether they be wise or simple, he reveals himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they will pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, we learn in our own experience who he is. After breakfast, even Peter, who'd missed the point so many times, was given a chance for redemption. There around a charcoal fire, just like the one where he denied Jesus three times, Peter was offered a threefold opportunity for his own resurrection. Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. On the surface, it looks like Peter's feelings were hurt because Jesus kept asking him the same question over and over again and didn't accept his answers. But in reality, under the surface, we see that Peter wasn't really answering Jesus' question. Jesus was using the Greek word agape when he said, Peter, do you love me? But Peter kept replying with the word phileo, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Agape is the word for self-sacrificial love, but phileo means fraternal love or familial love or friendship. Jesus was asking Peter for self-sacrificial love, but Peter kept replying with familial love, saying, I love you like a brother, Jesus, like family, like my closest friend. Isn't love all the same? Isn't this love I have enough? So Jesus keeps on asking. Peter, do you really love me? Friendship, familial love, and fraternity are not what Jesus was asking for. But it was all that Peter had to give at this point. Like a lot of us, he was still rising, still trying to figure it out. So after getting the same question twice and the same answer twice, Jesus changed the question and reduced his request To Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? Making it something that Peter could accept and could respond to. Jesus was inviting Peter and the disciples to take up the mantle of a new and higher kind of love, a love that does nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regards others as better than ourselves, a sacrificial love that looks not to our own interests first, but to the interests of others first and foremost. He was trying to teach them that they shouldn't be living and working and fishing just for themselves or just for their family and friends alone. They should be living and working and fishing for other people too, for all of humanity, feeding people who were not their family, freeing others who were not their friends, and raising up the poor and the marginalized and the pressed out of the waters of empire. But Jesus settled for fraternity and family and friendship even though what he really wanted was self-sacrificial love. The difference between the kind of love Peter and Jesus had in mind was suffering. Peter wanted love, but he wasn't ready to suffer, which may be why Jesus found him back in Galilee fishing on the sea instead of building the church, which he was commissioned to do. As Schweitzer wrote so many years ago, it is only by the toils, the conflicts, and the sufferings we pass through that we learn who Jesus really is and the task that we are called to do in our time. Both sacrifice and fidelity are necessary parts of the journey of following Jesus. There is no way to avoid the suffering. And as Richard Rohr reminds us, love and suffering go hand in hand. They accompany one another as two sides of the same coin. They are life's greatest teachers. We have to face them as the same reality, knowing that God is with us in both. 
Peter didn't understand the full implications of loving Jesus or the full reality of the resurrection. Yet despite these limitations, Jesus still called him to perform the most crucial function in the community. Peter failed his breakfast examination as he'd failed so many times before. Yet Jesus did not see his failure as an impediment to receive the calling to be a leader in the church who would take up the task of feeding the lambs on the way to slaughter and tending to the sheep in need of a shepherd. This is good news for us. It means our failures are never final and that invitation to follow is always open. Resurrection is not a one-time event or something that only happened to Jesus. It is a way of life, a practice of faith, a form of existence. Rising does not happen all at once and for all time. We die and rise all over again. Dying and rising is a sacred pattern of change written into the very fabric of creation itself that we will face as human beings over and over again. Like caterpillars transforming into butterflies. Like the return of the birds in the spring. Like the rebirth of perennial flowers. We rise and we fall. There will be ups and downs, fits and starts, oscillations between belief and doubt, courage and cowardice, praise and rebuke, fidelity and failure. There will be circles of denial and abdication, betrayal and resignation, nihilism and nostalgia, fishing and friendship. Yet that is exactly where God comes to find us and calls us again and again. Rising up is long and painful work because we are never going to be complete, unflawed, or finished products. We will always be on the way, imperfect and in progress. Yet no matter how many times we've failed or acted as if nothing ever happened, no matter where we are or what we've been through, no matter how much faith we can muster or what kind of love we can give, Jesus will always walk along our shoreline where land meets unknown sea, calling out to us as his beloved with an eternal invitation saying, Rise up, children, and come follow me. And all God's people said, Amen.